Okay, welcome back to the lab session. Um, in the past part, we've been doing um, some prompt engineering strategies, and now we'd like to continue uh, with some API uh, access and using APIs in order to actually um, avoid going through that prompt form all the time and to automate this. And we will also discover some uh, new possibilities uh, that we now have once we use this uh, programmatically and also see some metrics that we will be able to use. And um, yeah, I already shared my screen here. I would also suggest that you open the code up right now. We fixed the link, so it should now be available on the course website. And um, yeah, you will be able to follow along then. So this, um, apparently this installation here takes roughly five minutes. So if you start it now, then you can start coding along once I'm done with the explanations. Um, so what we do here is actually we install um, a Git repository, which is a big bench. So you already saw that in that video. Yes. Ah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Lucas. Okay, uh, so I was asked to also explain why we are using Colab now and not our self-hosted version or not doing it locally. So the reason is that we are using quite large uh, language models right now, which are a bit hard to host locally on your CPU computers. But also um, for us, it's a bit hard to um, make them available to you because. As you know, we have those layers in our computation center um, where yeah, access is restricted. And um, we tried doing um, a hosted version of some language models through Kubernetes, but it's a bit more complicated than we initially thought. Um, also, the models are quite large, as, uh, as the name says already, but um, it should be no problem. Uh, we also planned on this ahead, and you can use Colab right now. Uh, the space there should be sufficient uh, to get it working and going right now. Okay. Um, so, are there problems coming up right now with the Colab, maybe? So then we can fix them in, uh, beforehand. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, something we also, ah, I wanted to talk about Big Bench, what we install here. So this is basically, um, yeah, this setup pie that is being run there, uh, where we install all the modules that are being generated by Big Bench and all the tasks and all the evaluation methods that Big Bench introduces. You can check it out uh, over here on that markdown page or in the documentary and um, or the documentation. And um, yeah, another check message, check message. Ah, Lucas wrote something here. Um, we also install this over here. I'll come to in a minute uh, what this is. But yeah, once the installations are done, we should be ready with everything. Also contained in this is uh, TensorFlow, also contained is Transformers, so hugging phase should all be accessible then. Okay, the first step, using GPT-3, using the API and Python bindings. So if you click here, you will go to the API reference. Um, it's a bit tricky to use or not that intuitive because um, they suggest that you use this uh, call request form. Uh, so REST API basically. I mean, you could do that if you feel familiar with that, but we are doing Python here and there are some Python binding, bindings provided um, for this via this library here and it's installable using pip as we did up here. And uh, we can now use it, quickly import this. And the first thing we need to do because this is a hosted API um, you actually have to pay for this unless you still have um, free credit, those $18, which should be sufficient. Um, you have to enter an API key that you can get from this website here. Um, oh, 
Uh, you couldn't see it, it was abbreviated, but um, okay, then I can show it. Yeah, no problem. So uh, this is my secret key. There are many more characters in between here, but you shouldn't share it because, so for me, it's bound to my credit card, but I can, I can swap it out, so uh, no problem. And this is also the reason why it looks so weird over here. I can run this cell, but the cell code is not shown to you. Um, uh, the magic of Colab, and I hope I did not upload the key. No, I did not. Okay. So um, now you can do it on your own and try to enter your key over there. And now we are already settled to start. We can already um, yeah, write our first prompt and have it completed uh, through the API. Of course, again, it's, it takes a moment to compute, but here we have the result. And as you can see here, the API part is already called completion. There's also an insertion model available right now for a few weeks, uh, almost just. So um, feel free to try a bit around. Also, you can select the engine. Keep in mind that this affects the uh, cost per token. But uh, yeah, we just take the most powerful one here. And here we have our prompt that we specified what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. Does anyone know? Yes? Yeah, 42. Obviously, that's the only correct answer, but we'll see the difficulties with this later. Um, so uh, here, in this case, actually, let me try what this evaluation brought. The answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. Actually, um, we can prompt the model to give us multiple choices, which we could then, using our own evaluation function, evaluate and yield the best of them. So we would get multiple choices, but in this case, we just have a single one. Let me quickly introduce a new cell. So if you write uh, completion, you should get the data type, data type here, open AI object for text completion. And uh, if we see the choices, then we just have one object. But as I mentioned, you can... Uh, check out the API here and see whether you can get it to uh, yield multiple results. And what you can also do, let's see here, do, 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 completions. You can specify all the other parameters that you had there. Suffix, maximum number of tokens, especially useful if you don't do testing anymore, but a real application. Temperature or uh, top B, one of those you could try out. So um, taking more risk is uh, the idea there. Or uh, the other way around, whether um, you only consider tokens with top P probability mass. Um, you could try a bit around with this. Also, maybe incorporate this into your mini project. Um, how many completions to generate for each bond? This is exactly the option I just talked about, which would yield a different length over here. Um, yeah, string big partial pro progress. Um, it's a bit experimental, if I if I got this right. Log probability. It's a bit complicated, but basically it acts as white or backlist, a blacklist. So uh, you can actually. Um, using values from, I guess, minus 100 to, oh, no, 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 this is here, over there with the logic bias. Okay. Um, ah, no, no, no. So, uh, we come to that later. Yeah, sorry. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, logic bias. I'm talking about the logic bias. You can take this as a blacklist or whitelist. Um, so for values from minus 100 to 100, you can uh, assign a bias to each token that you want to talk about. So first you will get the token ID, and then from to that token ID, you can assign a value. And this will actually, uh, for negative values, yeah, make it more unlikely to generate them and almost surely prevents them in case of minus 100. So in case you want to block out uh, swear words, for example, um, you, you would use that feature. And if you would only allow a certain 
um, word array, then you could go and uh, take those tokens and set them to uh, 100, which ensures that some of them are taken. Actually, I know that uh, AI Dungeon had been using this option, um, at least at the beginning when they were still using the native open AI GPT-3 um, beta. So uh, they had been preventing or even offering a future feature to their content creators to exclude explicitly exclude some tokens. So for those of you who don't know what uh, AI Dungeon is, it's um, kind of an online dungeon role play game, single player role play game, um, just text-based as a text-based adventure where the initial prompt would be a short story prompt like you are in a post-apocalyptic world, you are surrounded by zombies, what do you do? And then you start with the story uh, and they did some technicalities to also uh, ensure that you stay in that realm and just don't teleport, for example, out of it because I mean, you have um, general console access there. You can write anything into the prompt that you want. Uh, but there are some measures to protect this and uh, to keep you inside that realm. And one realm is also to restrict the tokens that will be generated. And they use that feature here. So some options that you already know from the playground, like this uh, frequency penalty, for example, um, where you penalize repetitions. And also some uh, user string if you share accounts or billing accounts with multiple users, but probably not that interesting. But feel free to, to have a look at this and uh, take a closer look. So here's our result. Um, but that's still quite close to what we did previously, right, uh, using the form. Now we want to automate things and we want to do batch processing at least. And this is what we have here. Um, yeah, I just wrote down three questions in this uh, Q&A scheme and using a list comprehension, I'm simply uh, prompting them and try to get the answers uh, for the most probable choice as a text. And then I just print them using this zip statement. Let's try that out. So what do you see here? What may be the problems um, that you would get with such a format? So the prompts are not really aligned. So for example, here we have new lines. You would want to strip them maybe. Um, here, the answers are not what you would expect. So. Uh, how many meters in a mile? Conversion question here yeah, works. We, we saw that previously. What the color of the sky? Uh, typically a pale blue color, okay. Who are you gonna call? Who, who are you gonna call? Okay, Lucas is the only one knowing uh, the Ghostbusters, but uh, apparently not. Apparently you are calling Smart Snake. I was already uh, in the preparation asked to call the plumber, I think. Um, so uh, apparently, um, that's not some, something uh, GPT-3 ex expects. But hey, well, at least now you can do batch processing and this will maybe help you in systematic evaluation of things. But we will also see a few more measures to systematically evaluate uh, those tasks. And one of those lies in the video that uh, I recorded about Big Bench. So make sure to have a, have a glimpse at that. The next thing I promised you was uh, using GPT-2. And actually we can do that locally, even if locally just means on our CoLab um, computing space, but you could also do that locally on your computers, no problem. Uh, because with GPT-2, the model files are actually publicly available. And here we uh, use two things. We use Hugging Face, which provides the model. And we use the model class from Big Bench. Let's have a look at that. 
So in Bigbench, they provided wrappers for many models, including GPT-2. And uh, yeah, here you can basically see which models they um, allowed, GPT-2, GPT-2 medium, large, and XL, and also um, GPT-1, so just GPT, you can find it somewhere up here, over here. Um, so those are all supported, and you can actually see what they are doing, but I'll quickly go to another document here, because all those models implement an interface or an abstract class in Python, and this is uh, the model class, abstract base class, and it basically supports two methods, generate text and conditional log probability. We'll see that in action in a minute. But generate text does what you would think it does. You put in a string or a list of strings, specify the max length, maybe a stop string, and it would generate text. But you could also specify an output regular expression to pass your output from the model. So in case you want to um, get the numerical value out of this, um, yeah, you could use that. We will do that also in a minute, I think. And um, yeah, if, if you have a look at this over here, let's see, model. All those big bench hugging face models implement this model class that we just saw and basically provide this functionality. So if one of you were, for example, to contribute to Big Bench um, OPT, Open Pre-trained Transformers from Meta AI, what I talked about the other week, uh, you could do this, just overwrite or, or copy paste this class uh, because it's also available on Hugging Face. And I will also show you how in a minute. So um, yeah, maybe that's interesting for you. So let's import it. This is also why we installed all that Big Bench stuff to be able to import it here. But here we get the hugging face models that are supported by Big Bench. And um, yeah, we can just load up this model. Uh, what happens here takes a bit, um, it actually downloads the model file first in the background. Okay, I continue talking while that downloads, but I mean, it's not uh, restricted to our local network, but it's downloading to the Colab server. So no problem if all of us do this, hopefully. What we can see here, what we want to do next is we still want to generate text. Um, we also specify a max length here to just yeah, stop generation at, at a certain length. But this is not that interesting. What's more interesting probably is the result because uh, yeah, we already discussed that the result obviously is 42, um, but here it's not. So um, I actually added this, it is here to at least point it in some direction, but we can remove this in a minute and see what happens if we don't have this, it is. Um, but in this case, we just get, it is simple and it's not about discovering religion anymore, but, and then the max length threshold cuts in. So of course we would expect different results from GPT-2 than from GPT-3. And we'll see in a minute what happens if we alter the prompt here. So maybe this isn't an alternative to using GPT-3, but well, hope still lies in maybe OPT. We'll also try that in a minute. Let's see, I think we are unpacking the model files right now. Yep, worked. Okay, first the example just as it's written here. Takes some time actually. Why is that? 
but maybe this is the right moment to ask some questions. Maybe in the chat? No. Okay, I'm a bit confused why this takes so long. Didn't previously, but maybe something is still being set up in the background and uh, we just don't see it. Ah, okay, here we have it. So the answer, it is the truth. What is the truth? And what was the answer to life? So again, you, you see this pattern that questions get repeated or altered, even if you add question and answer to it. So let's remove this, it is, and see whether it's faster now. I hope it is, but apparently it is not. Maybe something ruined GPU support in the background, and we're in uh, uh, TensorFlow CPU right now, but I'm not sure. Okay, I'll, I'll continue talking about the next example, but I mean, um, you probably would expect it to be even more messed up, or at least what, what does messed up mean, but not aligned with our expectation. Um, let's talk about this example here. So we're doing some basic arithmetics. I even went this way and, um, ah, here we have it. Answer, sign and religion are inseparable. Question, what is the, and so on. So again, not the result that we were hoping of, uh, to get. So, as the next um, prompt here, we are doing simple arithmetics, and I even went the extra way to separate those digits by spaces to generate individual tokens. That's not uh, given to do that. And the thing that I first want to talk about is the output, which certainly does not align with our expectations. But another thing that I want to talk about here is actually this uh, regex parser that I already mentioned. So here we extract um, plus minus indicator if it exists. And uh, in each and every case, one or more digits. So this for those uh, who are not that familiar with regexes. But um, yeah, this regular expression should just extract the uh, number for us in the result. But as you can see, the result was not really satisfying. I can try to execute it and see whether it works this time. Fingers crossed. Why is it taking so long? I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, apparently this time we didn't even have any number in the output. Try again. Again. Weird. But I mean, if you consider what's happening here, it's maybe not that far off that we don't get any numbers here. But believe me, uh, I got a number once and it was two. Mm. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, we're in CPU mode. Okay, yeah, thank you, Lucas. Uh, but if I set it up all again, take, it, would, it would take five minutes to rebuild the package. Uh, how can I remove that? Um, so, okay, for you, it might go much faster, maybe. No. Did I destroy something? Uh, it worked today, so... Hmm, weird. Okay, we will see um, how it looks with the next models, but I mean, this will happen now each and every time I run something. But maybe maybe um, 
I, I'll have a look at this again, but it, it should work. Um, maybe you would have to enable this somewhere, but uh, I'm not sure. Ah. Okay, thank you. Click on the like up there on the one minute object thing. Yeah, that's it. Okay, okay. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah, I, I quickly repeat what you said. So the issue is loading the notebook from, uh, in your case, from GitHub directly, and in my case, from the cloud. Apparently, per default, you don't have GPU acceleration. Um, yeah, makes sense, but you need to know that. So on, on the runtime tab, change runtime type, uh, you can actually change that. Okay, maybe it's a good idea if I rerun everything. And um, wait, do I actually need to rerun everything or can I just? But it hasn't been flushed. It has been. It has been, okay, uh, I can try. Ah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it has been flushed. Okay, I, I will have to run. Ah, I was confused by this, but probably the download is persisted, um, which is good. So we save another minute there, but okay. I just have that run in the background and talk about the next example. But okay, maybe that's one lesson learned here. Uh, even if it worked all the time, it doesn't mean that it works if you load it again, if you don't select the runtime explicitly. Okay, what I'm showing here is a conditional log probability. And this is especially interesting for multiple choice tasks, like what color is grass answer? Then you, you can even use GPT-2 to get reasonable answers out of this. Um, so in a normal problem, maybe this would generate some garbage, but if you provide it with options for completion, this is not uh, classes or something. Uh, uh, um, uh, I think GPT-3 provides some um, classes API uh, where you could do classification of text snippets, but this is not what we're doing here. We're still doing completion, but completion on a fixed option space. So those are the targets that you could feed in there. And then uh, you get scores. So one score for each target. And uh, it's the logarithm of the probability that this target uh, completes the input. And the laws of prompt engineering tell us that you, will, you would expect green here. And in fact, green has the largest log probability and thus also the largest probability over here. Um, yeah, so this is how this um, multiple choice stuff works. And also this is available on almost all other models as well. So feel free to try around with this a bit and um, maybe it will help you um, to, to do text classification, for example, in your projects. And it also avoids this trick that we did in the last session where we talked about edge cases and uh, doing future learning with unknown and so on, um, and, and uh, other edge cases like sentiment classification, where you would also have to consider neutral or uh, angry, for example. Uh, this can all be avoided if you provide a closed set of answers. Okay, it's still downloading stuff. Okay, check back later. But I mean, you can execute it on your own then. And um, I pre previously executed and those are the results. And now let's talk about um, open pre-trained transformers from uh, Meta AI. They are believed to be the next big thing. Let's see, time will tell. But at least they are openly available uh, here on Hugging Face, for example. And you can download them and um, actually 
there's a very quick way of um, accessing them through this pipeline. And this is just uh, using the Transformers pipeline. So Transformers is uh, the Hugging Face library. And we will also do that. Let's do that here. And it is supposed to be deterministic also by default. Uh, I cannot import unless uh, this is all. Ah, it's building, so it's not taking long anymore. Let's see. Um, but as you can see here, generator, define a pipeline, um, a text generation pipeline to be specific on that model. If you run it for the first time, the model will be downloaded. And if you run this as a function, then just apply a call. Then again, you get potentially multiple answers. And then you extract from this dictionary that is returned the generated text. And here in this case, um, yeah, we not only get uh, the completion on its own, but also with the prompt. So what is the answer to life? The answer to life is to be happy. So not 42 anymore. And it's even deterministic. So uh, there were some instructions on that page over here on how to break that determinism somewhere here, over here. So uh, maybe you would want to try this out to um, see whether it's actually 42 in some random scenario. Okay, let's see what the building over here says. Uh, still uninstalling. So the problem with this Colab environment is that many, many libraries are installed with a prefixed version, but if you install something else, then it might be that everything has to be uninstalled again in order to have it work um, and uh, to not have a version mismatch. Okay, we finished. Great. Uh, let's try. Um, it should be downloaded already. Fingers crossed. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, apparently it's not, apparently the download was also flushed. Mm. Yeah, take a minute again. But then I maybe ask for questions. Maybe from the chat. No, okay, then I cancel this. I hope I can. Yes, I can. And then just do this uh, OPT example because you can run that on your own. It also has to be downloaded, but should go a bit faster. Okay, and we're done. And let's see this evaluation over here. So it should be deterministic. Okay, the answer is to be happy. Let's maybe break that uh, determinism by slightly altering the prompt, not the question, but the prompt. Ah, the answer to life is the answer to life. So, well, it's, it's not the largest OPT model. I uh, took a rather small one. You can also try out the other models, maybe at home. will take a bit uh, to download, but I mean, it's, it's Colab, so it's not on your network. But you can click here and um, expand the models, and then see which models are available. And there's a model with 6.7 billion parameters, one with 30 billion parameters. And those are quite large. So you could try them and uh, see whether they yield 
more reasonable results. This could also be part of your mini project, just saying. Okay, evaluation using text to text metrics. <laughs> um, this is something I want to talk about because it's not trivial. So for classification tasks, we already talked about metrics that you could use, accuracy. Um, there are also other metrics that everyone who already did a bit of machine learning should have seen already. Uh, remember precision and recall and F1 score, you can look them up. Um, yes, but we are not doing classification uh, metrics here. We are doing metrics that can be used uh, to apply them on generative tasks where you get text out of it. And one um, example metrics that is a traditional metric one would apply here is one that I would like to introduce or recap here and it's blue. And um, it's basically, you can look that up, but it's basically supposed to do um, or to measure the word correspondence. So taking a reference, so this would be your ground truth for the generation, you would have to define some kind of ground truth, that's right. And um, a candidate, so this could be the network output, the LLM generation. Um, you would try to max, match up all the words using blue and then compute um, a score out of this um, yeah, regarding how often this worked. And this here, this works reasonably well. So let's run that quickly. Yeah, score of 30, reasonably well because I mean almost all words match up perfectly. But there we have the first problem. And I remember that uh, one of you already introduced us to that problem in the very beginning of the semester. I think when Lucas was doing some, um, what did you do actually? Some uh, network results um, output. Yeah, you did some classification on a text here in the lab. And the question was, what happens if you introduce no? into the results or some form of negation. Will that actually alter the classification? I think we were talking about IMDB data and the question was, um, is there a difference between the sentiment analysis of this is a good movie and this is not a good movie? And it was quite hard actually for the network to, to consider this, but not impossible. We did, we did see some difference, but here with blue, because it's just measuring word alignment, we can run it and we get the very same score because one word is off in both cases. And this is not what we want in most cases. This is not desirable. Ah, thank you. Oh, God. Yeah, what is it? We can have a look at what it is. <laughs> Is this the, this the one that we are doing? I'm not sure whether this is the one internally imported. Uh. It gives 30% because you don't have corresponding foregrounds. Uh, I'm not sure. So, I mean, I mean, this was not meant to be an introduction of blue in the first place. It was meant to be a motivation of um, what we are doing here at all. Uh, maybe it's, it's using word tokenization and not foregrounds. I'm not sure. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, Lucas, thank you, Lucas. Lucas will be checking in the background how this is implemented. Uh, so I, I did this, uh, I imported this from T5. 
uh, but this is the same that's also used in Bigbench and the others. So it's probably this one reference implementation there. Um, but, but well, it's the same score here and we don't want this. And um, the idea now is that we get away from this um, traditional feature set or a metric set and apply what we learned in the previous weeks. And especially we learned something about um, language models, about transformers and about BERT, for example. And now we can apply this in order to actually define a matrix that is able to overcome this issue. And this is blurred. So some weird morph between blue and bird. Uh, but you can download this. It's a, it's a bird based model. So again, you have to do some model download over here. Oh no, it's taking long again. But I mean, the results are here, no, no worries. Um, you define the checkpoint that you import from, so uh, blur 20, which, is, which seems to be the standard right now. And um, you define a score here, and then just define or uh, um, compute the score. And this will be done uh, using a bird instance in the background, doing some TensorFlow eager execution, no worries there, it just, it's black boxed, so um, you just get a score. It's not compatible with bird, uh, with, um, sorry, with blue in the first place, so you get values from zero to one here, but I applied this to this is a test and this is the test, and to this is a test and this is no test again. And as you can see here, we have a match of 80% over here and a match of 60% over there. So there is a difference, at least in score, and it's in um, the direction that we hope uh, that, we, that we wanted it to be. So in the end, this is just to show you that um, all those methods that we um, introduced to you can be applied in some way to replace or improve traditional methods even in evaluation. Of course, you would have to make sure that um, this model itself is not doing weird things. Yes, I agree. And non-black box models or metrics might be easier to understand in that regard. But nevertheless, I think this is quite a promising way and interesting way. And one could also imagine doing similar things with uh, even larger language models and trying to evaluate a score there. But here's using BERT and it's, it's, it's a standard already. So feel free to also use this in your projects. Okay, oh yeah, we can run it now. It went through. So here we start a TensorFlow instance running that model. Let's see whether the results are consistent. Yes, they are. Same results confirming what I just said. Okay, are there any questions? Yes. Yeah. You mean these, yeah. these, 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 they are logarithms of scores. So let's, let's bring up a logarithm curve. Oh, I can just type log X, I guess. Yeah. And um, so that also explains why those are negative. So the logarithm is um, monotonous, monot monotonous in, in that range, but it's negative. But I mean, the highest probability gets still get the highest logarithm score. So yeah, this is what you would get here. It's a bit easier to compute in the end uh, and to further compute with. Um, yeah, that, that's the reason why they chose to have a logarithm here. But yeah, you can convert it back quite easily. I agree, yeah. 
Okay, the other, uh, what's, does that answer your, your question? Well, it, it, it is like that potential. Um, yeah, if, if you run this through, so let, let's quickly do that. Did GPT-2, ah, I didn't download it here, but uh, I mean, I can, yeah, I will just uh, do this. Um, uh, first import NumPy. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see what happens here. And you can see basically percentages and they even almost kind of add up to 100. Uh, I don't know whether it's intended. I think not, but yeah, you can in that um, domain, you can think of them as percentages. Should they add up to 100? Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit confused uh, uh, as well why well, they don't add up to 100 right now. They do. Ah, 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 okay, I was, I was somehow thinking about another zero in that, uh, in that place. Yeah, they add up. Okay, thank you, yeah. Confusion. Um, okay, great. That uh, pacifies me. Okay, your question, please, yeah. Yeah. It's, so yeah, I repeat the question. So the question was, yes, we saw for the mini projects, we saw some way of um, evaluation based on an objective ground truth. Uh, what about things like poems where there's no objective ground truth in generation? The question is, is it allowed to uh, do this subjectively and to rate the results? Yes, and it's even encouraged. So. Um, Yes, you, you will have to then rate uh, some examples, find a reasonable number. I mean, don't, don't spend too much time on that. Spend, spend your time on the real term projects. But yeah, like for, for one afternoon, I don't know, get, get a bit familiar with this and uh, label a few examples also subjectively. You could also um, maybe share some annotation task with your fellow students and exchange the annotation task and see whether there's an agreement at all between the annotators. So do all the tricks in the books, um, feel, feel free to do it. And um, yeah, but it's, it's a nice approach, I agree, to, to do some subjective rating and labeling. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it would be good to have them in presence, probably to also make it easier to react to questions. Okay. But the, the question, just from the question, it seems to reach an uh, ah, yeah, 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 we can we can answer this question of the presentation format via Discord later. Yes, I agree, and we also have to come up with a specific format uh, still for the presentations because I, I I think I limited them to like two or three minutes. It's on the slide. Don't don't take me by the word here, but um, uh, still, if we uh, if everyone. Um, hands in as we expect, uh, who is also signed up for a group right now, then this will still be quite a lot. So um, we, we've come up with a way, but um, definitely send in the slides and we will talk about or, or chat about on Discord how to do the uh, real presentation thing in the end. But the idea really is not to satisfy me and my demands, but rather to also into, to, to learn something yourselves to um, find out something and also to share it with your fellow students. So this is something that I find really important about the projects to also present them or yeah, give them out in some, some way to your fellow students. Okay, more, more questions maybe.
Okay, D did we find out something about this blue thingy? Okay, yeah, may maybe uh, let me look who, who asked this question. Yeah, yeah, Julian asked that question about blue four and whether um, or whether it's being used here and why we have that result if we are using four grams. So maybe you would like to um, uh, f um, do some research on that, Julian, because uh, you seem to be more of an expert than I am. And maybe maybe write it on Discord or something that would. Ah, okay. Julian says uh, it must be blue two because it would fit at least from the results. Uh, if you consider some penalty constant, I guess that uh, Julian doesn't really uh, know right now. But okay, then that clears, clarifies a bit the confusion that that we have had there. I mean the the. There's, there's an advantage of using such predefined and pre-implemented uh, metrics function, function. They are consistent and uh, available all through all repositories, at least all the repositories that I checked had the same implementation. But yes, yes if in the end no one knows, knows what's really happening there and what the implementation is, I agree that this, this is a weak point there. Okay, yeah, but thanks, thanks for pointing that out. Okay, now I would suggest that we go over to this um, promised FAQ or Q&A part regarding the term projects. So um, how, how should we do this? Should, should we stay here and have it uh, in a closed format or should we accept questions in, in the, the board format? Uh, you mean the general idea of the session? Yeah. A, of Q&A, ah, ah, okay. So um, thank you. Uh, the idea for these Q&A sessions, and if you look at the semester plan, we have actually quite a lot of Q&A sessions. Um, uh, so this was the last official lab session right now. Um, and in this, this Q&A session, sessions, and we don't want to make them really mandatory, but strongly encouraged, um, we would like to take some time to talk about your projects and um, address them individually because the projects are on one hand so different from each other and also for the teams that chose the same term projects, um, the implementations or instantiations of those projects will be very different from each other. So we would like to take some time to address all the issues individually, get to talk to you about your progress, um, about your requirements, for example, regarding hardware or something, but you can still continue uh, writing us on Discord and so on, and we'll try, if our time permits, to, to get to you quite quickly. Um, so this is the general idea for those Q&A sessions, and uh, as of now, I would, I mean, we, we have like uh, uh, 20 minutes left, so I would suggest that we do this on an optional basis, so not, not in the plenum right now, but if there are some questions, if you have some questions or issues that may also um, interest other groups, for example, about the pipeline, uh, there were three people already requesting access, so which is not much considering we have like at least 10 groups which should use it. Um, so, hmm. Maybe something is going wrong there, but um, if anyone has, for example, some issues or wants to say something about that, uh, this would be also the right point to do it. But otherwise, I would um, say thank you for your patience throughout this long session today and uh, see you then in two weeks. <laughs>